Hello, my name is Dr. Ina Park and I have the pleasure of talking with you today about gonorrhea treatment. So we don't know exactly when gonorrhea became a prevalent infection in the population, but there are historical texts referring to gonorrhea as far back as the 1100s. And euphemistically, gonorrhea has been known as the clap, the drip, and the running rage since the 1600s. So we know that we've been living with this infection for at least 900 years, most likely. It is the second most common STD, right behind chlamydia, and the US Centers for Disease Control uh, estimate that 700,000 cases of gonorrhea are diagnosed per year. However, only about half of these are reported for public health surveillance. So the culprit organism here is the bug Neisseria gonorrhea, and it is an intracellular gram-negative diplococci, which you can see behind me in this gram stain. And um, it looks like two little beans stuck together within the white blood cells that are here on this urethral discharge. So Neisseria gonorrhea can actually infect the pharynx, the rectum, the genital tract, and rarely can cause systemic disseminated infections. And those infections can be as asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic, which are commonly found in rectal, pharyngeal, or lower genital tract infections. Or they can cause these systemic, complicated infections of the upper genital tract, such as epididymitis or pelvic inflammatory disease. And so if you got gonorrhea in the pre-antibiotic era, you were pretty much out of luck because you could have gotten prescribed something as benign as five weeks of rest or avoiding alcohol or avoiding sex. But there were these really draconian treatments as well, including urethral dilation with these metal dilators or two weeks of urethral irrigation. And I would wage a bet that two weeks of urethral dilation would probably be enough to keep anyone from avoiding sex and avoiding alcohol. But um, this is what was around. So we had a very common infection and not a lot of good treatments. So if you can imagine, the introduction of penicillin in the 1940s was an incredible boon here in the US. And primarily because soldiers during wartime, as this World War II poster behind me touts, could be treated with penicillin and be battle ready again in four hours. And so in the US, gonorrhea treatment was such a huge priority during World War II that of the 500 first uh, cases treated with penicillin in the US, a quarter of them were actually cases of gonorrhea. So I wanna briefly go over a history of antibiotics for gonorrhea. And in the beginning of the penicillin era, gonorrhea was so susceptible that just 72 milligrams of penicillin three hours apart was sufficient to kill all gonorrhea infections. But as time went on, the amount of penicillin needed to kill a gonorrhea infection increased and increased. And by the time we got to the 70s and 80s, gonorrhea had evolved into something called PPNG, or penicillinase-producing Neisseria gonorrhea. And in that case, there was no amount of penicillin that was actually gonna eradicate that infection. And we lost the ability to treat gonorrhea with penicillin forever. Then we had these brief hurrahs with tetracycline and ciprofloxacin. And then gonorrhea quickly developed resistance to those so that we couldn't treat gonorrhea infections with those drugs alone. And you'll see that actually the only drug we have left now are the third generation cephalosporins, which are here in green uh, with the green arrow moving forward. And below, you'll see a drug called spectinomycin, which is actually an aminoglycoside antibiotic, which is no longer available in the US. So I actually wanna share with you, we know that gonorrhea can develop antibiotic resistance. And now there have been, in light of these antibiotic resistance patterns, treatment, uh, treatment recommendations have changed from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and I wanna share those with you now. So like tuberculosis, which is another infection that can develop resistance quickly if just given one drug therapy, gonorrhea is the same. And so one of the principles of treating these types of infections is to use multiple drugs simultaneously. And the same principle applies here for gonorrhea, so that the new recommended treatment for gonorrhea of the cervix, urethra, or the rectum is actually two drugs. And the first of these drugs is ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams by injection along with a second drug, which is either azithromycin, 1,000 milligrams, orally in a single dose, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams, orally twice a day for seven days. 
And now again, you might be saying to yourself, but I always treated with two drugs just in case a chlamydia infection was around. But now we're actually gonna be doing two drugs for gonorrhea regardless of what your chlamydia test result is. So if your chlamydia test result is negative, we're still giving these two drugs because we really wanna hold off antibiotic resistance as long as we possibly can. Now, your clinic may not have injectable ceftriaxone as an option. And if you don't have ceftriaxone as an option, then suffixime 400 milligrams orally in a single dose and dual antibiotic therapy with either azithromycin or doxycycline is also a viable option. But I just wanna point out that suffixime does not give the same level of bactericidal activity. And so ceftriaxone is definitely preferred. And if by some unlucky chance that your patient is allergic to cephalosporins or severely allergic to penicillin, you can also give azithromycin two grams orally in a single dose, which is not illustrated here. Now, treatment for gonorrhea of the pharynx is particularly challenging because the pharynx is a very challenging space to penetrate. And so for gonorrhea of the pharynx, there's only one recommended treatment, and that is dual therapy with injectable ceftriaxone along with azithromycin or doxycycline. And I wanna say that all of these changes in recommended treatments are in light of the concern that we have that gonorrhea is gonna lose the ability to be treated by the only class of drugs that we have left. And so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about antibiotic susceptibility patterns. And to do that, we need to do a little lesson on measuring antibiotic susceptibility. So the first thing to determine what kind of antibiotic will actually kill gonorrhea, we need to isolate the organism and grow it out on a culture plate. So you would do that on a selective culture media, which is illustrated behind me on the left, called a modified chocolate auger, or Thayer Martin media. And don't confuse that with the picture on the right, which is a chocolate cake with sprinkles, but the uncanny resemblance is there. But I would have to say that you will not mistake the uh, cake on the right for the uh, culture plate on the left because the cake on the right smells a whole lot better. I can guarantee you that. In terms of determining antibiotic susceptibility, there are many, many ways to do this. Um, I just have one example of that here, which is the E-test. And what we do is grow a lawn of gonorrhea bacteria onto a plate and then you place down these antibiotic impregnated plastic strips and they give you a reading about what concentration of antibiotic is needed to actually kill the bacteria. And regardless of whatever method you use to determine antibiotic susceptibility, you get the same result, which is an MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration. And that is the lowest concentration of antibiotic that's needed to inhibit bacteri visible bacterial growth. So um, when MICs increase, that means that you need more antibiotics to treat the same organism and showing that higher and higher concentrations of antibiotics are needed and resistance is increasing. So now that we know a little bit about MICs, I wanna talk about gonorrhea susceptibility patterns both internationally and here at home. And just for some historical perspective, we have patterns of antibiotic resistance for both penicillin and ciprofloxacin. Penicillin is behind me here in the red, and ciprofloxacin is here in the green. And I want you to notice one common pattern, is that the waves of antibiotic resistance always originate in Japan. And when they come to the US, they spread from Japan to Hawaii and then to the West Coast before they spread throughout the country. And we expect that the same will be true for the cephalosporins. So this Japanese woodblock represents the wave of cephalosporin resistance that we anticipate is coming from Japan, which will soon be hitting our shores. And just to show you some data from the CDC of what's happened at this point, in 2002, already in Japan, 30% of their gonorrhea isolates already showed those elevated MICs to the oral drug suffixime that I talked about earlier. And there were a couple isolates in Hawaii as well that you can see with the orange dot. By 2009, the, Jap the Japanese had already reported their first highly resistant isolate of pharyngeal gonorrhea isolate in a Kyoto sex worker that was highly resistant to the injectable drug ceftriaxone. Again, we had never seen antibiotic resistance levels this high before. This is the subject of the recent media superbug coverage that you may have seen. And again, in Europe, um, we had already seen some increases in ceftriaxone MICs, along with the cases from Hawaii that I talked about earlier. By 2011, you can see all the different cases of both ceftriaxone or suffixime treatment failure or elevated MICs that we were seeing throughout the world in both the EU, Japan, and other parts of Asia, as well as Hawaii. 
So what about here at home? Well, the CDC actually does a national surveillance project called the Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project. And they actually put out some data for the past 10 years showing what's been happening with gonorrhea here in the U.S. And they calculated the percentage of gonorrhea isolates with elevated MICs to the oral drug cefixime or the injectable drug ceftriaxone. Now, these levels that they report here are only for surveillance purposes, and we don't actually expect treatment failures at this level of susceptibility. But I just want to show you some interesting patterns that have emerged. And if you look at the West, which is illustrated here in the orange bars behind me, you'll see that in the past few years, the majority of the isolates that are showing those elevated MICs are located here in the West. And um, you'll see that, again, the overall percentage of isolates is not that concerning. It's less than 1%. But just to show you that patterns are pretty clear that the West is going to be hit first. And it's also not. Um, indiscriminate in the population in that certain populations are disproportionately affected. And you'll see that the percentage of isolates with elevated MICs to ceftriaxone is much more common in men who have sex with men compared to men who have sex with women. The men who have sex with men are illustrated behind me here in the blue bars. So who's going to be affected by cephalosporin wave of GC that's coming here from Japan? And I think it's primarily going to be men who have sex with men in Hawaii and California and other parts of the West Coast. And so providers who actually treat this population or serve a lot of um, people who are in this population really need to be vigilant about providing proper screening and treatment. So as a clinician, you might be asking yourself, well, what can I possibly do to help here? And I would say there are a lot of things you can do. And the first would be to screen people who are at risk. And for women, that would be young women, age 25 years or younger, um, and other women according to their risk. And then it would be men who have sex with men. And that would not just be screening them at the urethra, but screening them at all the places where they could be sexually exposed. And that could be the rectum, the pharynx, um, or the urethra as well. And then finally, treating with a recommended antibiotic regimen is very important. So we talked about the importance of dual antibiotic therapy, regardless of the chlamydia test result. And the dual antibiotic therapy is with ceftriaxone, the injectable cephalosporin, plus azithromycin or doxycycline. And then being really vigilant for treatment failures is important. Because if you have that patient in front of you who's been treated with a recommended regimen, hasn't had sex for a week, and is coming back to you and still not feeling better, then you may be looking at one of those early cases of gonorrhea, antibiotic resistant, sorry, one of those cephalosporin resistant cases here in the US. And so we want you to report those treatment failures to your local health department, STD controller, or call us at the state. And I'm going to let you know how to contact us here. For treatment failure guidelines, we have the most current guidelines up on our website at www.std.ca.gov. Or you can call our clinician warm line Monday through Friday at 510-620-3400. And we would be happy to talk to you about the proper treatment for your potential case of treatment failure. So I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, Bob Crocaldi at CDC, as well as Penn and Barry at San Francisco Department of Public Health, who shared a lot of their content with me. And I just want to summarize some of the media coverage from the recent superbug hype um, from the New York Times, from Fox News, and my favorite, which is The Onion, and one of their, um, one of their readers who said, suddenly, I don't really want to get gonorrhea anymore, which is my thought exactly. Um, thank you so much for your attention.